Okay, so good morning, everybody, and once more, welcome for the second time on this session. So what we'll try to do today um, in, in our tutorial really um, is to cover the areas that I've just um, highlighted on the screen at the moment, if you all can see. We will try to repeat what we've tried, you know, we did yesterday. But obviously, it's a forward and a backward movement. In the bulk of the work that we want to do today, maybe is around the reference in the technical reference. Okay, let's go back to where we spent some few minutes yesterday. Again, be reminded of the the journey that you are you are taking, which is the scientific journey. In which case, then our focus largely will be around systematic observation. And, and check this, observation can also be non-scientific as long as it's not systematic. So here, we're talking about systematic observation, if you like, you'd say vis-a-vis -vis the accidental observation. So it means whatever that you're doing, it's systematic. Now look at your research project and say, am I systematic in, in, in what I'm doing? And obviously, you know, for you to, raise, to, to, to answer that, you'll have to look at the number of uh, research and technical issues that we are going to be dealing with throughout. Control, and again, I repeat, please, uh, you know, put a lot of emphasis on the control at the level of internal control and external control. Mm -hmm. When we get to, when we, we start dealing with the issues of control, I think this is going to be a lot more clearer and replication. Now, this is where we were yesterday. Uh, and for those of you who were not there yesterday, please pardon us. This is where we were. And we just want to go back and check how far we have made with regard to that journey. Research problem or a topic, we said you have to have a topic. There's no research that never has a topic. No research has, you know, can be undertaken without a topic. When we look at the topic, really, all what we are trying to suggest is it must have a, there must be something that you are focusing on, a problem that you are perhaps wanting to resolve. That that's what that's what we we're looking at when we talk about research problem or research topic. Yesterday we also tried to look at one or two of the topics that were presented. And we realized that the good thing is all those uh, students that participated have research topics. Now it is from the research topic that any form of analysis is going to be is going to be uh, uh, undertaken. The aim of research, the literature review. This chapter is extremely important because what it does is it just reminds you as a student that you are not you are not the only one who is worried or who is curious. Now, the, the other area of interest really is, once you, you have done now your literature review or your literature scanning, you will then have to come up with what, what is technically called the research design. From a research design, we should be able to see how you are going to collect, how you are going to analyze data, which will then lead us into the the reporting, you know, how are you going to report on the data that has been analyzed? So if you look at the data analysis real, is that everything else is about what kind of data have you collected related to related to the problem or the topic? You know, in other words, what kind of information have you been given by whoever has been your sample from your population and you analyze that data? So six really tells us that this is what matters uh, in terms of the, the analysis of the data that you've got. So you are not analyzing the entire process, but here you are analyzing the data. So data is going to give you what the research is all about. In other words, you may, you may have had, as per the step three, some kind of an assumption or a hypothesis. But when you come to analysis of data now, you're telling us what exactly have you received from the information that you've been collected? So data analysis is very, very important in research because it just tells you what kind of data have you collected and what does it tell you 
in relation to the problem or the so you know the topic that you were investigating so if you are looking for for a a, a cure for say for example some years back covid 19 the virus you then look at what does the data tells you in relation to the virus that you're being you are, you are testing so it is it telling you that if i do x this will then the virus will then be suppressed or not so this is where you do the analysis of the data which then will tell you whether or not you found a solution or not because it is from there that you are able to match the data and the analysis to your hypothesis then on the basis of that then you compile a report so if you are looking at an experimental research you then say yes i am aware now i have got conclusion that i'm reaching that grandpa solves headaches you know to what extent i'm sure some of you will remember that during covid there was a story around some of the, the solutions that are not 100 percent they're 90 percent and so on and there was just so many scientists at the time that we have become most of us because if you say 90 percent <clears throat> and then people will say yeah but what about the 10 percent but if you look at the medication that sometimes we take for whatever different condition nobody really tests the strength of the medication up to the level where you'd say well at least if it's 60 percent is still better than the other one which is 40 percent so it is important to understand the analysis of data in context because if you say 90 percent is not good you'll then have to explain where why is it that for you that is not good in compared to what so what are you comparing that with because it's about the strength of the medicine as at that time all right <clears throat> today then let's just also look at the these are guidelines these are really guidelines it doesn't doesn't have to be followed in the way that it is uh, people do things differently as long as you know it works for you and uh, the reason why we think that we should discuss these guidelines it might be not it might be unnecessary for those of you who already have chosen topics but it might be important for you to share with us how did you arrive at the topic one two for those that still have to choose a topic this might also be something that perhaps you know can assist them in how they they think around the choice that they want to make you see with the research uh, it's like it's like the, the argument that research begets more research so the, if you do research you call you for more research so it's research and research and research i'm actually reminded perhaps by by um, Cloney's question yesterday. Yesterday, she said something very important, actually, and I want to I want to endorse it in, in the sense that she was asking whether she can have conclusions uh, with the research. And and I thought maybe what she meant. And, and again, I'm speaking, you know, under under correction because she's not here. I thought maybe she meant was what are the you know you you get to a point where you have you collected data and you've analyzed it and you make conclusions so your conclusions on the findings is what you are making so basically i'm not sure whether that's what she meant or you know because she said no no now i understand it's a research report because what it means is you 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 have research where you have conducted and collected data and you have analyzed data now in in the analysis of data you get to a point where you make conclusions on your findings so you'd say in relation to finding one i think i'm now certain that this is the result in so those are the conclusions that you can make in relation to the the, the findings so if ever you, you you interact with her maybe check if that's what what she meant in the in this context but it is important also that when you do research and you make conclusions, those conclusions relate mainly to your to your findings. Now, when you do research and when you read the research report, you're always going to find that you know any researcher is going to make a recommendation for further research. So, in other words, you'd say, "Look, I have um, I have done this work up to this level, and I think it will also be useful for those who will do research in future." to focus on the following. So they already give you areas that they could not, due to a number of reasons, that they could not research any, any further. 
So you can also use that as the basis upon which you, you start your research project. But the reason why they give those conclusions is really to say any research that you do will have limitations and will have delimitations. So in other words, you'll say, I'm willing to go up to this point and I'm not going to go beyond this point. So at least the person is giving you the parameters within which they conducted their, their study. So it is always important to know that when you do research, you're going to get somebody wanting to do more research and more research because it's just the nature. It's just the nature of science. Now, when you choose the topic, which is a very important thing, by the way, in terms of research steps, um, when you are going to do research, you are going to conduct research, remember we said the first thing that you need to have in mind is to choose a topic. It is important one to look around you because in many areas, I mean, uh, some of you yesterday were saying you're doing MBA, LLM, mathematics, science, you know, industrial psychology, property law, agriculture, all those things that you said you're doing. When you look around in many of those disciplines, there are a number of questions that need some answers or problems that need solutions. So the phenomena that need the explanations are everywhere. So if you want to know, I look around here where we are, there's a lot of uh, questions that need answers. You know, whether it's be virtual uh, platforms that you are using, life is just so it's just so littered with a lot of questions that needs answered. So whether it's from an agriculture point of view, whether it's from a, an ESCOM point of view, whether it's the, from a Russia-Ukraine point of view, whether it's the Putin who visits in South Africa, whether it's the favorite topic uh, of, 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 of Godfrey and I, of Makuduma and, and stuff, there, there, there are questions that always need answers. And that is everywhere in every discipline. So just look around. Then you must read the existing literature review about such a topic. When you read the existing literature, you then begin to find out what things are already known and believed about your topic and what is not known and not believed about your topic. So you already know. So this is already something that these uh, people in law would say is common cause. It's already known by many, or maybe it's not known by many, or it is believed by many or is not believed I mean, so you already know when you read literature that, okay, how far and how much is known about this topic? Or how much has this topic been researched before? Because sometimes the research is just to say, I know of this topic that has not been researched as much as I, you know, it's supposed to be. Therefore, I want to conduct my research along those lines. What it means is those kind of choices will de deal with them because it may be that it's, it's something that you want to explore or is something that you want to explain, or is something that you want to describe, you know? So in research, you can either explain, or you can explore, or you can describe. So there's nothing wrong with any of those chosen uh, uh, research designs that um, I just want to explore it, or I just want to explain it, or I just want to describe it. Then you seek advice of experts. It's always important when you have a topic, that you look at it, you read about it, and then you just seek some advice, you know, what needs to be done? What, what, what are the burning questions that still out there that needs some answers? What are the previous research findings didn't make sense? What, which ones of those findings really didn't make sense? What are you doing now? You are asking legal experts so that you can choose the correct uh, methodology that you want to follow and the, the correct design and a method that you want to apply to your, your study. Nothing wrong with that, actually. Then you, you move into, some of the students will then attend what is you know, professional conferences. It's very important for, for, for you as students to attend conferences. The reason why you attend conferences, other than the fact that you know, they are also just a good break from the day-to-day -day issues, is that there, You've got researchers have great success finding, finding new research project at conference. So when you go to a conference, you start listening to how the other researchers have had some success in their own work that they do. But in doing so, they are also giving, sharing with you what are the new research projects that are emerging, you know, which you can, you can, you can take care of you know, as, as part of your selection of a topic, because now you know. 
It is a topic that is worrying other researchers. And therefore, as a perhaps a new researcher, you may then pick it up and run with it. Conferences are a place where novice researchers or beginners may contact with more experienced researchers. It's, it's important that as a, as, a, as, a, as a beginner in research, you interact with those that are considered experienced researchers because the sharing of knowledge just, just wraps into you. You ask questions, you share ideas, and of course, you can exchange details that will enable follow-up communication. So you now are able to engage with, 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 with a researcher or somebody else that can. So basically it's like a process where you are now being mentored on a topic that is of interest to you. Then you choose a topic that intrigues and motivates you. It's always important that the topic that you choose must be of interest to you and it must motivate you. Because you see, when you do research, sometimes you're going to do it over a period more than a year. So it must be something that can sustain you uh, as you are a researcher so that you don't become de you know, disillusioned about it or it's a, it's a topic that has got very little information. Now you, you feel demotivated about it. So as, as you read the professional literature, you, as you attend conference and talk with experts, you begin to uncover a number of potential problems that or topics that may be of interest to you. So, that's, But at some point, you need to pick just one of them and select, and your selection should be based on what you personally want to learn uh, more about. So, so you may have like, you know, 10 and 20, because then, then you are in a, you might be in a situation where it's overwhelming and you've got the experienced researchers and now you've got about 10 or 15 or 20 subjects or topics. And remember, the project you're about to undertake will take months or a couple of years. So you need to pick one that you think, you know what, I'm interested in this one and I'll start building on it. Because yes, indeed, you can get to a point where you just collect topics, different topics, that they're all exciting. They're all, they all sound good. But at some point, you need to come to a point where you say, for me, uh, for my study, this is what I need to do. You choose a topic that others will find interesting and worthy of your attention. So if your research adds an important piece to, wh to what is already known by us as human race and understands about the world, then you'll want to share your findings with the larger audience. I mean, there's no point in doing research and you're not willing to share uh, the, important, the important piece of work or the findings that you have come across with, 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 with others. You know, that's why it's sometimes important just to present or to share your, your research with, with, with your peers uh, and with your colleagues and with your friends and so on. Because it's important to say, this is what I have, I have established. This is what I found. How did you do that? I had an investigation and this is what I've uncovered. So it must be shared um, with, with, with a larger audience. That is how you would know about it. Otherwise, you do research and then you keep it. And I think the university is doing well also in terms of just, just preserving and saving the research material into, in the libraries for those that want to go through them, to go to the library and, and read about them. And then you need to be realistic about what you can accomplish. Because it's very interesting that sometimes as students, we are extremely ambitious. And then we realize at some point that th things like, you know, budgets are very important when you plan for research. Are you willing and able to travel as far and wide as all these corners of this country? If not, then you need to, you need to be realistic about this that I'm not going to be able to travel. I mean, yesterday we were just making an example with, um, you know, to say, look, are you looking at China? Are you going to be traveling to China to collect data? Or what about the language? <laughs> Would you be able to speak Russian if you want to start Russia? Uh, you know, those are the, the, the issues that tell us that you are not being realistic in yeah. the way that okay. you're doing things. Sorry? So much time will, you know, how much time will it take you to collect the necessary data? You need to consider that. Because if you say, I'm going to talk to the CEOs of the top, uh, you know, companies at the JSE, you know, are they accessible? How much time will it take you to get the data from them? Because they may not be available for you. Will you need to travel great distances to get the data? 
I mean, you have chosen to do the SKA, uh, the square radius, and now you need to go to the Northern Cape and you are leaving, uh, studying it in Unisa Johannesburg. You may not have resources to get to, to. So, you know, those are the kind of things that you need to consider uh, when you choose a topic. Will you need expensive equipment? For example, if you say you're going to do impact, what kind of equipment will be required for you to assess and evaluate and measure impact? Do we know? Because those are the, the questions that you need to ask yourself. Will, will the project require knowledge and skills that, that are far beyond those you currently have? In other words, will you, are they above your, 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 your skill repertoire? Or is it something that you don't need to break any person's budget to, to do it? Most research problems are too large or too complex to be solved without subdividing them. So it might also be that you have to subdivide the problems that you are studying into sub sub problems. And in that way, then you are beginning to you are beginning to think about your own topic. At this moment, I'm going to pause and allow you to share with us how you chose your own topic and how what what were the the the, the considerations on your side. You all have had some choice of topic, except those that said the first time. I mean, I was hearing yesterday, you guys were saying, this is where I am now, and this is where I, I have already passed this stage. I'm at the data collection phase and so on. Can you just share with us how was your experiences in sharing, I mean, in, in, in choosing the research problem, some of you? How did you choose your topic? Um, I'm still in the process of choosing my topic, but my topic is based on where I'm working at at the moment. Um, I'm working at a bank, so I'm in the financial crime space. So I think I'll get more information because I'm already um, in the sector. And it's very interesting and it's very evolving. Financial crime is not known, um, not widely known. Uh, people just know the basics of anti-money laundering, but they, it actually goes much deeper than that. So the, that's how I chose to, that's how I chose my topic. So have you chosen a topic already? Um, I'm still pondering around it, oh, okay. but but it, still, it will be around financial crime because that's, oh, okay. the, that's the space where I'm working at right now. I get it. So, what, 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 what is the greatest, what is the greatest motivation for for you to choose a topic, and think that it's not going to be too complicated for you? Is it because of the, the, the area that you are focusing on, which is where you're working, or are you saying it's not going to be too difficult for you? Yeah, it's not going to be too difficult, number one, and it's the area that I'm working in, and it's a very topical issue. Um, many of the financial crime topics, it's a very topical uh, issue yeah. right now. Yes, so they're very topical. Okay, how those that have chosen a topic, are you able to share how you encountered, you know, how was your experience, just to share with those that are still going to decide to choose the topic? Just me? Thank you and apologies for joining late. I think what, what motivated me uh, to choose the specific topic for my LLM firstly had to do with my work experience. Having battled, I think, for a municipality and provincial government to fully interpret or understand specific provisions of the prevent that deals with the prevention of illegal evictions and uh, unlawful occupation of land. I think that was the first motivation because I thought that the way the law has been crafted uh, makes it difficult to fully understand uh, the, the implementation and just the ramifications of uh, not doing it properly. So what then I did was to choose a specific provision in the what is commonly known as the Pi Act. And I must say, I think one of the first the first challenges, the first challenge that I encountered was to fully 
like sending the message as to what the problem is uh, that mm. I want to, to look into. I think that's the first thing. And I think it took about a year we, when I did my proposal with my supervisor to, to get to, to what the question will be, the legal question for, 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 for my research. And I think over, after a year, then we went to, into the, the COVID period. And as I completed, towards the completion of my proposal, then things had changed in respect, or there had been developments in respect of the application of the, the, the PI Act. And there was a suggestion that probably because the topic uh, has been, you know, largely written about, then with my second supervisor, then we agreed on reviewing it or getting a, a particular perspective on that problem. And we eventually agreed on including uh, the current status at that time, which, which was COVID. So my topic looks into uh, the constitutional analysis on the application of uh, the law during COVID. So I must say that I think for, for those that will choose a topic or are thinking of a specific topic, firstly, <laughs> Uh, the question is how how much has the topic been written about uh, and what is the gap? And as time goes on with the research, you will find that there are continuous developments that one has to take into account. And it does, I must say, it does influence your research topic in that you have to craft it to really take into account what the gap is and whether there's still gap still relevant at that time. So that is my uh, input or the experience that I can share with those that uh, are still to choose the topic. Thank you. You know what you've just done, uh, and thank you for that also. You've just outlined something that we call methodology in research. Uh, and But you were quiet, you didn't want to volunteer this information. Because remember, methodology is about how did you arrive at the choice of a topic? And this is what I'm trying to get students to, to share. As, and you said, look, I looked at where I work. I considered the, you know, the, the, the COVID-19 situation, which has you know, some kind of a bearing on the topic. There was an issue around time that it has taken. All those are methodologies. All those are things, those are lessons that you share in research as to how long it can take and why. Now, I want us to talk about this. I really want us to talk about how did you choose your topic? Because somebody, I mean, the 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 the, the fact that the the Linda was saying she's um she's she's she has also chosen, is it the Linda? She's, she, has, she has used her work environment. Seems to be another way of saying, I use my work environment, but then I look at the issues around financial, because she believes that that's where her assumption is going to be. And she believes that that's where her interest or maybe curiosity is directed at. So it's important that I understand how, what was the methodology that each one of you had to follow, because things work differently for everybody, but at the end of the day, the outcome of all these exercises is to come up with a topic, the right topic that you're going to share. It shows you that you're saying the guidelines that I'm sharing with you are not necessarily followed in the way that they are, hence they are called guidelines. So let's talk about choice of a topic, the methodology thereof. Um, is it, is it Don Besiza? Don Besiza? Sorry, I think you have, uh past the stage, it was when you wanted us to share the topic. I think it's an old hand. Please do. Oh, Please do. I know I'm still, we're still sharing. We're still sharing experiences. All right. So when I initially applied for master's, I actually chose a topic that had to do with the credit risk management within the financial institution because um, I had experience in that. But okay. after I was admitted, I actually, with the supervisor, 
decided to change the topic because I felt like if I wanted to leave that organization, I was going to be stuck in there and the topic was not um, really like keeping me so excited about it. It was more like choosing it and getting admitted. So then I like with the experience that I have seen uh, with SMEs and how they were failing like within maybe a year of operating. And also I felt like the banks can actually do more like <clears throat> relationship managers or bankers as they are working close with them. So I felt like with their experience, they can like help them not just to be driving sales, but to be more like trusted business advisors for SMEs, especially those that are just started. Then, so when I was choosing um, the topic, then I thought about um, like I wanted to do a quantitative because I wanted to finish my master's within two years period. So I wanted to use survey and I'm also mm. based in Gauteng. So I wanted to like my sample to be around Gauteng. And also then I was like <clears throat> thinking about the municipalities uh, of the SMEs that I wanted to choose. Like then, so I drilled it down. Then I went, I was like, okay, I want to choose maybe the city of Ekuruleni because that's where I'm based. And okay. uh, so that's the other thing. And then, um, so then I started to engage uh, with people from that uh, city of municipality to see if they will be able to allow me to access the information and to access those SMEs. And then, so the, the manager then was like, okay with that. And then, uh, yeah, so then I saw that it's gonna be workable. Then I started to go through the literature review Actually, now I'm in the, my research proposal has been approved uh, early this year. So now I'm busy with the literature review. Yeah, yeah. I'm busy with the literature reviews and research. But I did a preliminary during that stage of uh, the topic to see if it's the topic that is doable. And also maybe getting some insights from uh, like people uh, from the bank that like those relationship managers and their managers to get an input to it. Is it something mm. that's really gonna add value? Cause I felt like they were like, yeah, it's definitely gonna uh, add value to the, to them to know exactly how they can better assist those SMEs. Wow. You see, that's very important that you're, you're sharing Tom, because you are now saying, I even, you, it's like you did research before research, you know, just to suss out the situation, whether there will be permission, whether it will be for benefit to them. All those things are part of the methodology. By the time you then study the topic, and you know, whether you are going to refine it, you are going to review it, yeah, I was just saying to Tom, this is quite good because all you're saying is I did not just plunge into this work. You know, I did some work. I did some work before the actual work. That's very, very important in research. And and one other point you raise, which is also a, an empirical point of research, is the fact that you you wanted to make sure that it's not going to be something for that belongs to a particular sector, you know. So motivation was very important for you that I need I need to be motivated enough beyond where I work. That's very important. And remember we said, if you are going to be stuck with a, sub a subject for a while, you need something that will, you know, you need to be kept motivated. So I I think I, I, I'm, I'm happy with that. However, what I'm trying to say is the exercise that we are trying to do here is just to say, let's share the what we call methodology. Yeah, I wanted to ask, um to me, I think it was. What mm. um why did she say she wanted to do quantitative? Like is there is it more beneficial to do quantitative? Because she said she can do it in two years. Um because I'm also between qualitative and quantitative right now, and my supervisor also advised me to do quantitative. So yeah, I just want to know how she um okay so what, like what, aligned with that. Yeah. So you think she will answer? You think she will yeah. answer that? Let's see. Okay. Don't, so don't the reason. Hi. I'm, can you guys still hear me? Yes. Perfect. All right. So the reason I chose the quantitative over qualitative or mixed because um, while I read about them during the proposal, 
the mix this was gonna take me too too long right because i would have loved to do it as well so that i can interview the bankers as well but i wanted to finish early um qualitative was not really gonna help me to answer my research questions to say that like on behalf of the smes bankers this is these are the uh, attributes that you need to be deemed as trusted business advisors so if i interviewed people Maybe it was going to be few. So I felt like it was not going to be able to answer them. But if I can go for quantitative, then I can like select a big sample from that big uh, population. And like, yeah. So th those are the other reasons that uh, made me choose quanti uh, over qualitative or rather the interviews over choosing surveys over that. It was because I wanted to answer that. But I would have like really loved to do both. But because of the time, because I wanted to finish it within two years uh, period, yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> it, it, it's, are you, are you, are you happy, uh, Shaina? Yeah, yeah, I am, because... Um, I'm not happy. Oh, okay, <laughs> but I, I'm I also I'm in between like the interviews and the surveys at the moment, so... Um, I don't, agree, I, don't, I don't completely agree with oh okay i don't completely agree with uh, with Ntombi, but i suspect it's because we don't have we don't have the details so let's shelve that discussion for now um on quantitative qualitative and the mixed methods i'm not sure i agree with Ntombi, but perhaps it's it's a it's a discussion that we can shelve for now we per, perhaps we can shelve it and and persuade you at, at at a different level. Uh, let me listen to Steve. OK, good morning, everyone. No, my 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 contribution is only based on the aspect of only focusing on the on the quantitative, because if you look at quantitative data collection, at times it will be just having closed questions, which may not give you some in-depth information that you can manage to get from the qualitative. So that was just the, 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 the contribution which I just wanted to to put across. Okay, so, so thank you for that. It looks like, um, Godfrey, we, we are going to rush quickly in our next engagement on quantitative and qualitative and mixed method discussion. Uh, because we don't want we don't want to go there head first at the moment. Yes, you are right, uh, um, Steve, that insofar as quantitative is concerned, it's about numbers and qualitative is about uh, more insight. So th there's is nothing, no method is wrong. It just depends on what are we investigating. So for me, I would not want to delve into it yet because I think we still, we still at the, at the, at the much more at the beginning of the stages. And I don't know Ndombi's topic. So at the point when we get there, maybe we'll then start asking the topic because she's saying, She's gonna finish very quick with quantitative, um, and I would have thought it's the other way around because quantitative is a huge numbers, and qualitative is really about five people, seven people, whatever the case might be. But anyway, and remember, there is also a principle that you should put down. We call it triangulation, uh, where you you use different methods of data collection in order to strengthen your, your research. So I'm saying let's not, I think for now, let's allow the, the, the discussion to flow in the way that it has so that we don't cause more confusion. Because the idea of this exercise in the main for now was around how did you choose the topic? So I think insofar as the process of how she chose the topic, we we can we can all agree. Uh, well, I I'm, I'm comfortable with the methodology followed uh, in that regard. But as to the research designs and the type of approaches, I think we can we can debate that. But I'm saying for now, maybe that shouldn't be uh, what obsessed us because there's no. It's not to say it's wrong, um, but it's just to say we don't have a a good understanding of. Of, of where she is. I'm going to quickly rush to the area mm -hmm. that I want us to focus on a little bit. We'll come back to the other issues. This is what I want to share 
with with you for every person who is really going to be worth being called a researcher this is the most difficult and the most important part of the work that we do at some point we're going to talk about the concept that you might have already used in many instances called plagiarism but for now we are not focusing on plagiarism you know where you take somebody else's work and you make it as if it's yours how many of us have um, some what do you call it on you know you've got uh, on your either your whatsapp or your you've got something that it's really you know it, it goes with with your spirit and you put it as your is what do you call it is the status or something that you put there as a motivation how many of us have that and in some instances you have it and you put it as if it's yours isn't it you know how easy is it to for us to do that And how many of us use Google to do homework or children's homework and just say, okay, let's Google this thing and see how it works. And, and then we give it to a child and we send it to school. A lot of us, right? We all do that. And in some instances, if not in all instances, we never acknowledge the source. So we'd say, um, you will say something extremely fascinating and very interesting. And it's, it's, it's quoted on your, on your platform. And it appears as if it's yours. So we'll talk to plagiarism at some point because that's the most important uh, aspect for every researcher. And at your level where you're doing a master's, it needs to be avoided at all costs. I mean, using somebody's work as if it's yours, it's not allowed in, in academic uh, space. So let's look at technical referencing, ladies and gentlemen. Sources in the in the list of reference must be done alphabetically by author or authors, same name or same names. So when when I look at your 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 master's uh, dissertation, the, you know if I'm the examiner, I quickly just go to the list of reference and check if things are done alphabetically. There are students who are taking this alphabetical order of things for granted. And please, that shows no, no care and lack of details. I mean, as a researcher, you need to know things are done alphabetically, like A followed by B and not the other way around. So it's important for you to familiarize yourself with alphabetical way of referencing because it's very important. So. Either you've got an author, or in some instances, you've got more than one author. So there will be authors and their same names. So I am Pelmos Mashabela, but I see you're Belinda. So, you know, a B in, in the first name is B, but because B is not the same name or the last name, it doesn't come first. It's the, it's the second name that comes first. So it's an author's same name followed by the name, the, the initial. For the, so they are not numbered. So you don't write number one, so and so. Number two, list of references are not numbered. We don't number them. And then the separate piece of info is, is standard followed by a full stop. So at the end, when you put the title of the book and everything else at the end, you can put a full stop. And sources are given in the language of the source itself. So if something you're reading something that says, I you know it's a it's it's written in Zulu or in Tswana or whatever, you put it in the in the in the in the in the language of the source itself. So you don't translate it. So in other words, if it's a Guruleni and you cannot pronounce a Guruleni, you don't make it Israel, you know. So it's still a Guruleni. So if we were to use, for instance, a German book, its title will be in German. With the exception with the English translation after it in the square bracket. So if you want to translate, you put it in the square bracket. And the place of publication might be München, not Munich. So in other words, you, you put it in the in the language that it is, so that anybody who wants to refer to it knows exactly where you got the information from. Place of publication is followed by a colon and the publisher's name. So some students take this thing for granted that sometimes they put a semicolon and a colon, you know, and, the, and then the publisher's name is never there. 
you need to say who published this source that we are you are you are, you are referring to. So when you look at the book, when you take a book, you know the first few pages of the book always provides you with who the publisher is, which which year was this uh, 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 when well, if it's a book published and so on. If author's surnames are the same, then the author listed first is the one with the first alphabetical initial. So you've got the we've got Brown and Brown as the authors. So you don't say Brown D and Brown B. It's going to be Brown B who will come before Brown D. Why? Because they are the same surname, but D doesn't come before B. So if you look at the, the authors that are, you know, there are people who use surnames, two surnames, like Mpafudi, Mpafudi. So if it's Mpafudi, Mpafudi, you look at what is the initial of the Adam Pafudi, because it means there are two people. So the one with the B will come after, will come before the one with the T. It's very important. The, these are the technical referencing, uh, you know, uh, issues that we are we, we are discussing for for a purpose. And when you look at the author referencing again, initials followed by date of of, of publication. So you put a date of publication, you put an initial, and after that you put the date of, of publication. So the book was published in 1994. It was a Freedom Day, Mandela what? The initial must then be uh, put, or initials or initial. All multiple initials are separated by full stops. So if you've got the um, Mandela, Pafudi, and all that, there must be full stop without any spaces in between. So you just put a full stop, which separate multiple initials. So you've got brown D full stop, brown E a full stop, and brown S full stop. Now, remember, whichever choice, whichever choice you make or, or you, you apply, it must be consistent throughout. So you can't decide well, I'm going to make D and then I put a, a, you know, a semicolon. The other one, you make another, another initial, you put a full stop. That's inconsistency and is not tolerated in, in, at an academic level. So you, you choose, whatever you choose, then you, you, you stick to it. You become, it's, it's, it's the way in which you are going to, you're, you're, you're going to do your referencing. Examples, Barbie, you see comma there, E, full stop. 1990, full stop. The title of the book is Survey Research Methods, full stop. It's the second edition. And it was published by Belmont C.A. Watford. Secondly, if you, you know, we can use another example, the Lidi, comma P, full stop, D, full stop, and you see the sign there, and or omrot, full stop, I mean, sorry, comma dot J is colon, all the way. Those are just examples. So if multiple entries for the same author, that is different publication or article, then the author must be listed by date. The oldest comes first of the publication. So sometimes you've got the, the, the multiple entries. The oldest one, I mean, the book that was published in 1980 will come before the book that was published in 2022 because it's the oldest. So you also look at the year if you've got multiple authors. So if you've got something that was published in 1970 and you've got something that is published in 1980 and something published in 1990 and it's the same kind of authors, the oldest one is going to be first. If there are two or more from the same year, they are indicated again first in the year by month. For example, look at this one Jones A 2004 A or Jones A 2004 B and Jones A 2004 C. Because they, they seem like they, they, they were all published in the same year. So the separation there is, is maybe by a year or whatever. So such additions of A and B and C 
would then occur in the text reference. So when you write in the text, and I see A, which is Jones 2004A, I know that I need to go to the to the one that was published, as, you know, under A and B and C. So it's the same same author, but publishing different, uh, you know, I mean, given the different distinguishing feature, which is A, B, and C. But all of that published in 2004. That is insofar as the authors are concerned. Again, I'm saying, please take your time, go through referencing because it's important. Some of you, and I think I've already had people who are doing law, there will be some kind, some legislation that might be referred to. For example, the Criminal Procedure Amendment Act 65 of 2008, full stop. The Department of Justice in South Africa, and that is a government gazette. If they, these are referencing that will appear on the actual legislation. Correctional Matters Amendment Act 5 of 2011, you know? So this is one appropriate way of referencing legislation in full, like in full. Let's then move on and see sources that are referenced in text. As you type, sometimes you use these references in your text. These are indicated by the same name or the same names of the authors or the authors and the year of publication, as well as the page number from where the reference is cited. Let's say, for example, you've got Nkosi, colon, 2005, 4. So what it means to me, or Nkosi, 2004, 5, 4, what it means to me there is that if I get to Nkosi, that you have referred to, I don't need to look for anywhere else. I need to go to page four of that and I'll find exactly what you have cited in the text. So I'll then just take Nkosi and I need, I know the year is 2005 and I go to four, I must then find what you are talking about. The other area of, interesting, of, of interest in, in the referencing is the use of et al. I know people love using this et al term. You know, although it's a Latin term, it means and others. It's, well, it's no longer, Itali we're no longer Itali italicizing it. So it's no longer put in italics. So it, it has become, we have accepted that et al has become now part of the English lexicon. So you, don't, you no longer put italics when you say et al. So it's no longer italicized. So if there are only two authors, both author surnames are used for every in-text reference to them, not at all, in place of the second author. So you don't, when they, you're just talking two authors, at all should not be used. The temptation is there to want to use it all the time, but please remember, not when there's two authors. In, in two authors, you use the authors all the time. In the text, the first time three or more authors are cited in the text, then all authors names to be indicated in the reference. When you use it for the first time, I mean, when you are citing more than two authors, the first time you use all of them, you cite all of them. Then it's only thereafter that the first author's name and then the term LL can be used. So it's me, uh, is Pelmos, is Cajiso, is Belinda, and is Godfrey. These are about four authors. After that, then you can just say Cajiso et al. It represents all the authors that you've, you've used before. So you don't use et al though in the list of reference. So you can then, when you do the referencing, use uh, Amaniti et al. You need to put all those authors in full. So you need to understand, you use it, you, you don't use et al at the beginning where you started with the full authors, you use it thereafter. You don't use it at the, at the referencing, uh, the list of references as well. Secondary referencing. 
These are references that are not primary. For example, Morrison, 1998, as cited in Prince Lou. So in, in other words, Prince Lou is the primary reference, but Morrison was cited in Prince Lou. So this is generally not acceptable in academic terms. So you, 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 can, you, you don't need to cite Morrison who is cited in Prince Lou. Because you can simply just go to Prinsloo, to the main, the, the main or the primary source. Authors should go to the primary source. That is Morrison, 1998. Because, sorry, I think I'm, I'm confusing you. The Morrison, 1998 is the primary source. So you can go to the primary source and you reference the information directly that has been used from the pages in the Morrison publication. So in other words, if I quote you, and I am the secondary source, ideally you can go to the primary source so that you get the right information there. Because if there's an error in how the secondary source or reference has quoted the source, it means there will also be error in your uh, citation. Because you don't know whether they've cited that information correctly in the first place. So sometimes in the newspaper or journal articles, in a journal article, a specific person is quoted. So if I write as a, a, a journalist or in the journal, I write a journal, uh, you know, you can use my, you can, you can quote the person directly because they're the author of the journal. In other words, such person does not have a primary publication from which the information has been quoted, but was interviewed by the writer. So you, you're taking what is being said in the newspaper as it's cited by the journalist or the, the, the newspaper article, because it means it's a direct quotation from that person, not unless it's then being disputed at some point. In such circumstances, the person so quoted can be referenced accordingly by name. For example, if you've got, let's say, the National Commissioner Silivi, he cited in Mashaba in 2008, said that. You see, that's, that's said to be what he said as a national commissioner. Subs must fight drug dealers on the street. So, so Mashaba is being believed to have interviewed the then national commissioner at the time. And this is what he's been saying. Let's look at the other, the other most important common area of referencing, which is the internet information. Internet information is treated exactly as if it's a publication. We're now living in a state, in a, in a period of life where really there's a lot of internet referencing. In the internet, you look for an author. Sometimes it's merely the organization on whose website such information has been found. For example, you go to an organization, they put some information there, so they may not, it may not be an author. Then you have to try and establish a date for when that the downloaded document, if it's a document, was placed on the website or the report. Often it's in a, in a PD format. If we do that now, I'm sure we can, we can come up with examples. If the date of the publication is unknown, then you have to use an abbreviation called SA. You see that? SA means you don't know the publication, uh, the date at which this was published is unknown. So you're telling me this is where I got it. This is the name of the document, but the date at which it was published is unknown. When I see that in the reference, I know that you are acknowledging that the, the, the date at which the document was, was put on the, on the internet is unknown to you at least. And if the, there's no place of publication that is indicated, the abbreviation will be SL. So that means, for me, if I see SL is that the date of, I mean, the place of publication is unknown to me, to you as, at least as a, as a, as a person who, acts, who was accessing the information. These are technical referencing issues that you need to familiarize yourself with, but also engage your promoter or your supervisor to check what is acceptable in their case, because others have got a different referencing system. So indicate the title for the document. So in other words, the document will have a title, even if it's a PDF. If you don't know the date, 
you would put the SA. If you don't know the place, you'll put the SL. But the document's title must be there. Then a publisher, usually the, it, it will be your the website organization, e.g. it comes from Consumer Goods Council of South Africa. So remember, no place of publication SL needs to be inserted unless indicated in the, the document that you've downloaded. The use of the term, the, sorry, the use of the terms available at, remember when you go to the internet, it will then show you there by the window, available at, it followed by the, the URL web address for the downloaded document. Please don't take the URL web address for granted. It is very, very important for the purpose of referencing. I need to know where did you get it from? Realize that available, that A is capital available. This is then followed in brackets with the terms accessed on. So when you, are, when you check that window there, it will show you when did you access, or, or alternatively the term will be retrieved on. Again, you need to decide, are you using access on or retrieved on? And once you do, you choose any of these, like you've accessed it on, on the 10th of June, 2023, at about 11.20. Now, you can't then say accessed on, then later on you start using retrieved on. Remember, consistency is very important. So there is also a, a colon use after at, retrieved at, or available at, or on. It's followed by the date when such internet document was downloaded. The date should written out as 6 March 2012. So in other words, you say 10 June 2023. If you access anything today, it will then be not, not the format will be in full, like 6 or 10 June 2023. Whichever form that you choose to use, you have to apply that uh, consistently. So is available, has a cap, accessed is a lower ca case used and that there's no full stop after the URL web address. But if you choose to drop the brackets for accessed on, then a cap A. In other words, if you don't use the brackets, then you're going to cap accessed as A and a full stop after the web address after the, the, the web address. There's a lot of Wikipedia references that are not, that are used lately, but remember Wikipedia, Wikipedia references are not a primary source of referencing and they are generally not acceptable academically. The, 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 the most acceptable academical uh, referencing is the Google Scholar. Go to Google Scholar, type, you know, put it in and then type in what you are searching. So Google Scholar is the most acceptable academic, not Wikipedia. If you want to move into the scientific space, this is where you, you are now, you're now going to find yourself playing in. The issues of spelling. South Africa, we use UK spell check, not USA. For example, we don't use Z in organization, which is spelling, but we use the S, which is which is the UK one. So let me pause here and ask, how did you find, as you were doing your referencing yourself, how did you find, before we go back to the other, other stuff, but we will de we'll, we'll, we're going to be dealing with referencing quite a lot as well. I just thought today we need to be looking at it so that you, you have a feel of what it entails. If you look at the, the today's thing there, it will say under Teams, there's a window there that will tell you it's teams.microsoft. You know, the whole, the, whole, the whole window there. So you can also do a referencing on when did this take place. So it's happening today. Uh, now it can, be, it can be referenced as well. I see Tavisio's hand is up. Uh, and is it SI? Please go ahead and Gracia. Thank you, Professor. Sorry, Professor, I had a question with the referencing before yeah, we can start sharing our, experiencing, our experiences. So my question is, 
if I download a document that was published by the World Bank or a document from the World Bank, but it was an author, a specific author who wrote the documents. So in the in-text reference, must I say World Bank indicates that, or should I write the name of the author of that piece of information, which I found from a World Bank document? Thank you. Yes, you can, you can, you can, you can, I think you can use both. Uh, speaking and I think, well, I don't exactly know what you mean, but if you download a document, you've got a document with you, and the author is Gracia, and it has got a date, and he was writing it for the World Bank, you can say Gracia, and you're referencing to what the document was. In other words, what was it, what was it meant to do? I'm not sure I understand you well. Let's say it's a document where which the author is mentioned and the year is mentioned and the title of the document is is, is available. Is that what 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 we are talking about? Yes, because sometimes when I'm doing my literature review, I am seeing people quoting the organization, like UNICEF says. World Bank says, oh, but the okay. name of the author of that piece of information in the document also, yeah. Yeah, if known, if the author of the document is known and the title is known, the year is known, you can quote the author. Because when I go into that document, I'll find the same document. The, 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 remember, the idea of referencing is to, to direct me to the right source. So if you say it is Gracia, and it's 2022, and the title of the document is inflation or whatever it is that you will be looking at, then I'll get to the same the, the same document. So then you can quote the, the author as well. But Thank remember, you. remember if you are then is an internet document, you can also quote the site at which you accessed it. Because if you do the same and you say, I have uh, available on www.worldbank and, 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 so it will be available if I go through that route as well. Thank you, Prof. You're welcome. What what is your what is your other uh, area of interest when it comes to referencing? Is it how do you find it and what how do you how do you navigate the challenges of, of referencing? Russia? Is that a question for me? Yes, that's now directed at you. So Okay, Prof. So uh, I attended a, a workshop and the supervisor mentioned that they want the page. At first, I was just writing the title and the year. So now I have to put the page. And another challenge I had, I was not, uh, when I was in the list of references, when I had to put an internet source, I was just putting the U, the link, URL link. Sorry, uh, I speak French. My English is a bit funny. So in the link of in the list of references, I was putting uh, only the link. Now I see from what you have said, I have to go back and write the name of the author and then add the link. The accessed on and available ads, I've yeah. been doing that. But I was also getting a bit confused because uh, when I'm doing the, the list of references, I didn't know if I had to start with the internet sources first, HTTP, HTTP, or if I had to start with the ones that the authors are known first. Now you have explained it clearly. I understand that I have to put the name of the author, the name of the document, and the URL, URL link here. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. The, like I said, I mean, the, the, the idea is to make sure that if anybody wants to go and check, if indeed you have, you, have, you, have, you, have, you have cited the source correctly, that those details should be there. So I can then go and access it in a, in a week's time. Mine will be the same, but I would say accessed on the 16th of June, 2023 at four o'clock. It will still lead me to the same uh, source that, like as you do in the library. If you tell me the book is, is, is called X, published in 1996, and so on, and then I go to the library, I ask the librarian, they will have to give me the ex exactly the same book. You know, that it may not necessarily be the one that you, you read, but it, it's, I'm saying it must be the same source, you know, and when I go to a page that you said you, you referenced from, I should really get exactly that. Anybody else who wants to share 
uh, their own experience when they were doing literature review and working on their topic and doing referencing? What oh, you know? Awesome. Really... Have uh, has anybody done referencing other than Gracia, or you guys are still not doing? It? What, what was your experience? Let's 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 spend uh, a minute or so sharing. Do you find it easy? Do you find it difficult? Do you find it exciting? You know, I don't know. I, Mashigwani, please go ahead. Yes, thank you, Prof. I think from my side, <clears throat> the referencing uh, that we use uh, uh, as the College of Law is a scholar uh, referencing. And one of the challenges I've had, you know, with the case law, I've been used to referencing using paragraphs from a specific case, you know, paragraph, uh, the paragraphs are numbered. And mm. the preference by my supervisor is to reference using pages. So the page numbers. So yes. when you download the case number, the cases, you will find that if you're not direct, uh, directly downloading from the journals, like the South African Law Journal, maybe you, you download from uh, Safli, you'll find that there's a big difference. The cases, as you download them from the Safli side, they just have page 1 to 10, page 1 to 15. But from the specific journal, maybe the, the JUTA or the South African Law Journals, you will find the actual numbering from the journal. So you'll find that I think that, that, that issue I battled with quite a lot because when I submitted my proposal, I had used the paragraphs referencing and only to find that it's not preferred. I've got to use yeah. the page numbers as they appear in the published journal. I think what, if one gets that right from the beginning, you'll save yourself uh, a lot of time uh, avoiding to go back and uh, redo the referencing for the whole document. Uh, yeah, I think that's true. one one issue, uh, but I've tried to sort that out. And then the second one deals with the, the secondary referencing. You see, with, with some of the writings that uh, I've gone through, uh, you will find that you want to refer to the uh, primary author and in instances where the writings are very old, there is a challenge with getting the correct page numbers because you'll find that some of the, the, the articles are published from old documents and you battle to get the correct uh, numbering. Some of them don't have uh, the correct uh, uh, or proper page numbers that you can use for as a primary source. I think that one was also, is also one of the challenges that I've, I've encountered. And then the last part deals with the internet, uh, info, uh, internet referencing. Yes, Google Scholar, it's correct to, to use some of the internet um, references, but as you, uh, maybe the, the, the preference from supervisors, maybe depending on what college it is, they are not preferred. I hear that most of the writings appear on the internet, but I've been advised, especially looking at the topic which I, I, I have selected, which looked at what was happening during COVID. A lot of the references came from the internet, were from the internet, newspapers and the like, but uh, being uh, advised not to look much on um, internet uh, information i think it's quite a challenge where do you get some of the um, the sources uh, some of them come directly from the internet so i must say that uh, from my side that has been a challenge the internet information um, as you correctly say that these are new references to indicate sa where it does no, you, you, you know, it's not known where the publicate the date of the publication. I think it's new to me, as well as the SL no place. Maybe that can assist uh, where you don't know where the publisher is or when was it, when was it actually published. But I must say that the question for me 
is why is internet information not really uh, rely maybe um, acceptable or preferred in some of the colleges because most of the information I agree is on is on the internet. So from my side, that still remains a question mark on why we cannot use some of the sources directly from the internet. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mashikwan. I think you said something very important. Um, we, we should just uh, rely I and mean, uh, emphasize that point, that it is ideal to use sources sources that you know uh, have got pages on and they come from a credible uh, platform as well i mean if you've got a journal that says uh, from judah and whatever and it says page seven i need to go there and because that's that's the point of referencing but if you're using paragraphs yes i wouldn't have uh, encouraged that myself because it's very difficult to rely on 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 paragraphs so i i like that but also, there's nothing wrong in citing a source which you don't have, um, you know, the page numbers are unknown, like all sources. You can indicate the source, but you can also put in, you know, a, a, a reference that shows me that, yes, I quote this, but I don't know the page number. But the page number of this source is unknown. Perhaps it's because the number is unclear or whatever. The, the point of referencing is to acknowledge fully uh, what sources you are using so that it is clear to everybody that you have not uh, sufficiently acknowledged the, 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 the sources that you've used in your work. That, that's basically what it is. So when you, when you, you don't know the page number or when you don't know the place, or when you don't know the year, it's it's okay to say I've got this source, but I don't know the year. I'm sure you see some people putting in there saying source unknown. So in other words, I've got this, I like it, but I don't know who the source is. You're acknowledging that you are not, it's not your idea, it's somebody's idea. And if the owner emerges, you know, you will acknowledge. So you're just saying the source of this uh, nice motivation is unknown to you. The fact that it's unknown to you does not necessarily mean it's unknown to everybody. So when you say source unknown, this is also acceptable because you don't know who the source is. However, some people tend to just take it for granted that when the source is unknown, then they are the, you know, it's theirs. So that's not that. That's what we are. That's what this technical referencing is trying to. Uh, in doing it, we're trying to share with you that you need to acknowledge the source. I see Tabiso's hand is, is up. Uh, go ahead, Tabiso. Okay, thanks, Prof. Uh, perhaps go my ahead. question is two is twofold. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, my first question was around uh, the first part of your presentation, but in addressing this question, I think also with referencing and with what uh, I forgot uh, her name, the, the previous uh, participant. Uh, I think uh, sometimes it also depends on the drafter of the assignment or of the, of whatever you, you call it. Because uh, in my previous assignment that I had, the drafter specifically asked that we, we must quote paragraphs especially with case law. So, Prof, I was still saying that uh, at times it, it also depends on the drafter of, of the work or the assignment, because I just wanted to highlight that in my previous assignment that I, I had, the drafter of the assignment specifically asked that we, we must quote the, the paragraphs of the of the judgment that was uh, the focus of of our study can, can you hear me Prof? yes we can yes. yes 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 so i i just wanted to to buttress the point that perhaps i'm of the view that uh, referencing also needs a, a due diligence because especially in the fraternity of law 
it, it takes various forms because you discover that at times maybe even in the uh, what you call a uh, they call it the footprint uh, referencing. You'd find that some scholars tend to be detailed in their footnote referencing, you know. So, yeah, that's my input. Um, I'm not sure the paragraph, what, what do you mean? Because I think I'm hearing it now for the second time. My understanding, and please correct me here, is that when you cite a source and there's a paragraph that you are taking from the source, right? That paragraph will be will be will be referenced using a page. For example, you'd say, according to Tabiso, uh, 2023, on a then you take that paragraph. So I know the paragraph comes from 2023, page 70, whatever. Is that what we are talking about? Uh, Prof, uh, okay, perhaps let me say this. Uh, a case law has uh, got paragraphs by design. Yes. Would, yes, uh, and, 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 and yeah, I stand also to be corrected because perhaps you would find that at times maybe you are requested to summarize the judgment yes. and maybe and maybe there are critical points in the judgments. Maybe those critical points for argument's sake are highlighted in paragraph number four. Then right. it's like you are now referencing that you you had paraphrased this uh, particular judgment on paragraph four, so and so and so forth. So, yeah. Because okay, so what is the preference, what is the supervisor's preference in your case, you say? You say the preference is that you need to use the paragraph. Yes, you need to, to quote the, the paragraphs wherein you, you got the information. And the paragraph with, doesn't have, it doesn't not have pages with, either. Notwithstanding also that you must uh, quote the pages. Oh, okay. All right. I see. So you can you can quote both the paragraph, but it must also correspond with the page numbers. Yes. Oh, but okay. but this no, was no. just occasion by by that work I'm 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 referring to, oh, because okay. it, in the previous instances it has not happened that way. Okay. No. Then Thanks, then I, I I'm with you, I'm with you there. I'm with you. There. Thanks, Prof. The, 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 the other other students, how do you find referencing? I, I, I was expecting a lot of um, a debate on this because some some students find it very difficult, others find it very easy. So maybe let's share. I mean, it sounds like you you don't have challenges there. And don't don't be. Prof, I think S's hand has been up. I don't know if I uh, should allow him or have. Oh, his... maybe. Uh, Yo, yeah, apologies. I may, maybe let's allow. Okay. Uh, I can't see that hand. Okay, it's me, uh, Professor. What I only have two questions. You know, like for the proposal that I'm having and the topic that I'm also going to be looking at. I got some challenges in terms of getting more source documents pertaining to the topic that I'm covering in that specific area. So I don't, I don't know how that can be that can be dealt with. And the second question that I have it's in terms of the age of the source documents. The documents that I'm coming across with they are more than ten years old. So can I be allowed to use such documents? Yeah, okay. You are you're asking two difficult dif different questions. Let's let's check. You say sources are, are not available. Are they available or are they old? I'm coming across old sources, but they are very limited at the same time. Okay, so you've got old sources and then they are also uh, older than 10 years. Yes, yes. So can now, I be allowed to what what those? what, what? What, what sources are you, you looking at? I mean, there are books, there are journals, there are... Um, you don't even have journals either. Like some, some previous studies on the same topic in the same area. Yeah, I'm saying you don't even have the uh, latest journals. Have you checked journals? 
Yes, I've been trying to look for that, but it has been difficult to to get them. So I don't know how best I can go about that now when it comes to referencing. Okay, because I I, I want to answer the question, but I, I first want to see how far and how, uh, how much of your literature review and search have you done. So journals, you say you, you, you're struggling. Are you doing it yourself or you're using a librarian, a library? No, no, most of the information I'm getting them through Google Scholar. Okay, you may want to engage a librarian. By the way, the UNISA have got um, one of the good libraries and the librarians there are there to help you in some of those searches. But I hear you. If you say there, there's, there, there's a, there's a, I mean, the, the source, the sources that you find are scarce, one, and they're old. Then you, it's, it's, it's a finding on its own, isn't it? Isn't it a justification where you say, this is the reason, I mean, you are, you are mentioning it to, as, as an observation yourself, as a student. And that, that could also be possibly the reason why you have to study the, the area. Does it make sense? Yes, it does. So you, you are discovering as you are liter as you are doing literature searches that not only are the materials scarce, but also they are old. So therefore, it makes it easier for you then to say, look, because they are scarce and they are old, you are now going to have to bring in some freshness in it. So you need to say so, because that's a statement of fact, if, if that has to be true. And that's the, the, basic, the, the reason why you need to study. Thank you so much. So, so for me, therefore, you can also be justified in using older material because you don't have anything new. And that's the basis upon which you select, I mean, your selected uh, uh, topic is it may be relevant. And Tom, you can, you can continue now. Uh, we, we have handled uh, Steve, hopefully. Yes, thank you so much, Prof. You're welcome. Thank you, Prof. My biggest challenge uh, with the references was with the proposal. When I submitted the first draft, though, when I had to go back actually and insert the page numbers, it took me like the whole, whole uh, month. And right now, one of the challenging things that I'm finding with the references is to balance between the in-text and the listing. Because sometimes I write something, maybe two weeks uh, down the line, then I decide I no longer want this or it doesn't make sense. And now maybe I have a reference that is I listed at the back. Like it's it's like it's just too much admin having to manage that process uh, and also trying to make sure that, you know, the consistency when you're listing the commas and the dots. Uh, but I also found it very useful for this session uh, to deal with uh, you know, quoting from the same author, but uh, using different journals. And I didn't know how to deal with the different years, but at least now I know from this session. But, you know, the references are showing me flames. <laughs> the admin around it. <laughs> no, but, but once you, no, that's true. And and I'm glad you, you're honestly saying that. Because for me, the, the art of you as a researcher really lies in the referencing but it also lies in the data that you're collecting. So key to your study is how do you do reference? And then second to this is how then do you do uh, your, 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 your collection of data? Because referencing is, is technical and the collection of data is really you getting involved in one way or the other. So I like, I like the fact that you are, you are alive to that reality that yes, it is not as easy, but it's, it's more the details that you... So for me, what I want you to do when you leave this session, really, you know, most of you, just, you know, just, just do some little bit of work on referencing, the different types of referencing, and see how detailed this process can be and very strenuous. And I think you said it's quite uh, admin heavy in that you, are, you now have something in the text and once you, you, you've got something in the text, check if it's a book, it's a journal, it's an internet you know, reference, or it's a newspaper, because those are different sources. Is it primary? Is it secondary? You know, that, all that work, you know, you, you, you need to look at it. At the end of the day, I can even say to you, when you look at your own referencing, I mean, at, at, at the level of a master, some people will even go to tell you that you need to have at least 150 
uh, is it 150 uh, referencing or more? Then look at how many of those are primary references. How many of those are internet material? How many of that is uh, it's uh, it's newspapers and so on and so on. You'll be amazed in journals, and you'll be amazed on you know how much you have you have mined uh, in the work that you have done so far. So and it doesn't mean that. Of course, it doesn't mean that when you say we're referencing, it must always be paragraphs. I mean, you can just refer to a one statement by, you know, by one of your favorite speaker or whatever. So, so again, it's it's about acknowledgement of the fact that the information doesn't come from you. However, what is also key is, as you do so, be mindful of the fact that be mindful of the fact that when you you do the referencing you are not just referencing because you are referencing you also have to add your own understanding remember we said it must be critical so uncritical literature review means nothing so it's like you agree with the statement that says the following i concur with the point you know so you are you are, you are doing your own analysis which analysis shows that you are alive to the, what you are referencing i hope it makes sense so you reference and you say I, you know, my hypothesis is this, and this is supported by, by this literature, that literature, this source, that source. Like what Steve just said. Steve said you can then do a, a search and you realize that material is old and material is scarce. That's his own, that's already his own observation. So he can actually say, uh, make that as a statement. And what does he substantiate it with? With the materials and the sources that is going to demonstrate that indeed this uh, material and sources are old. I hope it makes sense. Okay. Um, I don't want to overload. I don't want to give you to overload you now. I don't want to overload you now. So maybe at this point, let me allow uh, for engagements with with all of you because what i thought today we had achieved not fully though is that at least to an extent we 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 we, we have now been able to look at the the guidance on how to choose the right topic we have not dealt with issues of hypothesis and operationalization and reproducibility and all that we'll come back to that soon but at least you have also been able to look at the technical referencing of the work that you do. So for me, this is this is what I thought we needed to achieve in the next day or two. You know, to understand what research is, to understand those seven steps uh, that you can use to achieve. I mean, uh, seven steps that you can use to choose the research topic, but also how to deal with issues of technical referencing, which most of you will be required to do. Any any interventions from your side for further discussion? Any area that you feel uh, we need to be spending a lot of time on going forward? As I said, I mean, we have not spoken about uh, a hypothesis. We will do that um, in, 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 in a short while in our sessions, but I just want us to really engage a little bit more on research as a lively lively discussion. I I was expecting a lot more of a, a examples on your referencing because I take it that after you've chosen the topic, you surely, you surely in your literature review and in your aim were guided by literature as you are you're working with it. Um, I see Steve send this up and that I'm just going to randomly select one or two people to for, for a comment that they haven't commented. Yeah, Why? Uh, sorry, Professor, this may be irrelevant, but I just want to know, do your sessions okay on every Saturdays or there are specific time timelines? Uh, uh, that Godfrey is going to have to answer you on. Uh, he's my boss. I'm only contracted, so if he says come, I do. Um, so you'll you'll deal with that. Do you want him to deal with it now? Maybe he can. Uh, Godfrey. 
No, Prof, let me deal with, with that at the end of the session and again in terms of answering some questions relating to the recordings. When you are okay. done, I'll, I'll attend to it. Thank you. Okay. There are those people who haven't spoken today at all. I'm giving an opportunity to speak. Brenda, you can talk. Uh, yes, uh, hi, Professor and colleagues. So I want to know, I watched a Netflix documentary. Um, I don't know, would that count as a secondary uh, referencing? Because there are a few ideas there I got on that documentary on dirty money. You can quote the Netflix uh, in full as to which documentary, you know, and if you know the year at which it's done, you can. But I see Steve Sand is up. Maybe that's something that he wants to prefer a response. Steve, are you dealing with the with the Netflix? No. Uh, sorry, Professor. I was trying to drop down my hand, but it's still popping up. I'm sorry. Oh, oh, okay. So so Brenda, you can quote Netflix because it's a it's a docu that you can say, but you just have to quote it in full if you get what I mean. Like when was it? What is it? When was it done? Uh, it, 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 we are not necessarily saying everything that we are citing should be uh, academic or something, but it's just to say where do you get that information. And if it's uh, information, if it's something that has triggered your interest and it's linked to your topic, surely you can quote it. Is that, that, does it make sense, uh, Brenda? 100%, Professor. Thank you. Good morning, Prof and colleagues. Um, nothing upset me. I just... <laughs> I got a lot of um, realizations today or sort of aha moments with the, a lot of the things that were said, particularly regarding referencing as well as my topic. Um, I do have something to say about something that you guys discussed earlier pertaining to the topic. Um, as I was making submissions to my, my supervisor, my initial start point and the information of the sources that I was coming across were very rare or hard to find. Um, this led me to yeah. also look at the procedural aspects of what I was, my topic relates to. Then I started working more with the PIA, PAJA Act in relation to the disciplinary hearings and how mm -hmm. it is procedurally correct. So my topic then morphed or it changed. And what I started with and what I'm currently working on is not the same thing. Oh, I see. But and but you, also, you, 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 you should appreciate you should have appreciate the, the fact that uh, it is when you are trying to work on something that you realize that there's not enough material, isn't it? That when there's not enough material, it's almost like, you know, you have to pull your hair out. And that's part of research now. Very frustrating at the same time. However, <laughs> today has also made me realize maybe it's a scope of work that needs additional work to be done. So maybe I should pilot it or alternatively just stick to what is more... There are more sources on it, there's more literature on it, there's more mm. information because yeah. I did find myself being stuck. Yeah, remember, remember it's good also when you find that there's not enough material to work because basically it calls for a different type of investigation on your on your on your end, like what Steve was saying. So thing, but at least it's 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 an opportunity where you then say, okay, there's not much. And there's not many people who have done this work. Therefore, it might be groundbreaking on your side. You know, if it's too old, it means you're bringing something very fresh. Uh, and also, if it's too limited uh, in the in the past that people haven't done it, it means you're bringing something, you're adding to that body of, of, of knowledge. So there's always the reason why, you know, we as long as the methodology is clear and you understand exactly at what point you are, because no research, no two different research will be the same. You know, somebody can just deal with teenage pregnancy and the next thing, they've got a garage full of material. You know, somebody's dealing with something and it's like, oh, you know, you're just sitting with yourself and a laptop and only a few journals. So again, that's that's acceptable. That's that's understandable. You just need to know at what point are you in terms of the the research methodology and the, the research design that you, you you're working on. When we meet again, I think we now that we do understand the, the 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 choices of topics, I think we'll now get into the process of hypothesis and the literature reviews and all that, just so that we 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 are once more provide further 
uh, impetus to the work that you've already done. But hopefully by then, all of you would have worked on your own topics, you know, firmed them up, and also just played around with some kind of, uh, you know, referencing in your own work. Because if you do the referencing well, 60% uh, of your work would have already been done. And by the time we discuss plagiarism and all that, you shouldn't, you know, have any any difficulty. So in terms of the question, I think one of the students ask uh, when we'll be having uh, another class on how we work me and prof is that we have is either we'll have a first week to cater for the students who are doing honors masters and doctorate so we have three levels of students that we invite but we invite them mostly separately because for example we just started only yesterday and i only started with students that are mostly who are doing masters uh, on friday and today yeah? Going forward, I need to invite now students for the almost same topic, but students who are doing honors, we need to cover them. Then we'll have the students who are doing doctorate. After that, then we revert back to the students who are doing masters. So for now, when I'm, I'm looking at my schedule, because at the same time, we want students to have enough time to go through their work so that when they come to the sessions, they can have those uh, questions or the challenges that they are encountered uh, to come with in the session so that it can be in a session whereby is is students uh, getting giving control of the challenges that we, we they they are encountering so for now just for now maybe it will change but for now meaning next week we'll have students mostly who are doing honors then we break a bit for a week. Then meaning for the class that they are doing masters, this particular class for today and yesterday, we are retaining on the 27 and 28, just for this month. Then we'll revert a bit. Maybe I'll double check the schedule again with Prof because in between uh, some important information that I need to inform you is that we still have the one-on-one -on -one classes of which if ever one-on-one -on -one consultation where students are want a, a special attention in terms of their content. They are able to email me, I'll write my email on the chat box, then I'll find out the, where the, the prof is bit available so that he can have uh, 30 minutes with the students just to give a special attention for those who feel that they, they want special attention in terms of whatever they are doing in terms of their research. So we try to infuse the students who are doing honors, masters and doctorate. So is how we work in terms of our consultation. But for now we'll return on the 27 and 28. Then after then it will be the month of July. Then we'll just revisit the schedule a bit and I'll double check the times which prof is uh, available because everything it depends on his availability. So when it's available or not available is where I'll edit the schedule a bit so that we, we can try to have classes where prof can have enough time to deal with the students. So for now is the 27 and 28. I think after that on those classes I'll have a bit of an adjusted schedule for 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 July. Mm -hmm.